Hi, my name is Nick Rains from Leica Camera Australia. In this video, I'd like to talk to you about the Deluxe 7. I'll show you some pictures and I'll show you how I set up the camera. Here's a few sample images taken on the Deluxe 7. This is Sugarloaf Rock in Western Australia, and this is using the wide angle end of the zoom range, which is 24 millimeters. And then at the other end of the zoom range, this is uh, one of the waterfalls in near Blackheath in New South Wales. At the 75 millimeter end of the range, you can zoom in a bit and pick out details in landscapes. Then of course, you can do details inside. This is actually a high ISO shot taken at a, a country fair I was photographing last year. And uh, in the, 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 chink, the, the chicken competition section, all these chooks sitting in their little compartments with their awards. So a very useful camera when you're just wandering around without necessarily having your serious camera with you. The same event, there was um, cattle mustering using uh, working dogs. So one dog has to work a bunch of cattle through some yards and gates. And uh, even this sort of relatively random movement can be captured by the Deluxe 7 as long as you're, you're careful. It's not going to compete with a, you know, a really high-end camera like the SL2. But then again, that's not what you're really buying it for in the first place. It's more for visual notes and, and, and pictures that you shoot more casually and more spontaneously. Man from Snowy River uh, competition down in Victoria, uh, just seeing how the camera reacted in low light. So this is at dusk and we've still managed to capture the movement and uh, okay, the horse rider is blurred, but I quite like that sense of action. And of course you can see what he's doing on the TV screen on the right hand side of the picture, which adds another dimension to it. In Asia, uh, these are chili plants being uh, planted into little tiny pots of um, potting mix I suppose you would call it uh, makes a fantastic pattern so the camera is great for those little visual notes that you might take when you're wandering around on, on, on a holiday or something same with a picture like this just in a marketplace just interesting patterns and looking down a staircase at a, a shoe vendor the thing that intrigued me was the fact that each shoe has a little plastic foot inside it quite unlike what you see in Australia and this is a earring vendor in the same market. I just love the density of these little stalls and the fact that the proprietor is having a bit of a snooze with her feet sticking out. Windsor Castle, just on holiday, wandering around casually, um, using the, the camera as essentially a snapshot camera, but still able to get the sorts of, I'll call them proper photographs, which you expect from a good camera like this. Looking for the patterns, repeating patterns, always a good compositional tool. And you've got the repeating patterns of the arches and the soldiers walking past. This is taken in Köln in Germany. This is the cathedral in the city centre in the black and white mode. I have added some effects afterwards in Lightroom, but you can shoot in monochrome and then add a bit of a tint later, which work quite well. This picture I've put in because it shows how you can actually time a shot really well. That train is moving and the gap between the carriages is exactly in the centre of the picture underneath the arch of the roof. Now if you pre-focus the camera and hold your shutter button halfway down, you can actually get the camera to be much more responsive because all you've then got to do is just twitch your finger and it will shoot. If you have to auto-focus and shoot with a whole movement of the shutter button, it will take a bit longer to lock on and shoot. So if you want to be really, really responsive to a shot or something happening, you should pre-focus, hold and then shoot when you need to. The last picture here is the same cathedral shooting against the sky. And I was very impressed how the optics of the lens handle that bright background. It wraps around the spires of the stonework quite nicely without going all flary. So that's quite impressive. So there's just a few pictures that I've taken with this camera. Let's have a look at the camera on the outside before we get into the menus, just to explain some of these controls on the outside. So on the top plate, we've got shutter speed, we've got aperture, exposure compensation, which we'll come to in a short while. This little lever here is for the zoom function. There's a focusing ring here. This little slider on the top, which is a little bit hard to see, is the aspect ratio of the JPEGs that you capture. 3 to 2, 16 to 9, 1 to 1, which is square, or 4 to 3, which is halfway between the two. Leave it on 3.2 and then you'll get the maximum number of pixels. And if you want to crop the picture later, you can do that in post. On the side here, we've got the focusing choice, which is manual focus or 
macro focus or auto focus. Now, when you're in manual focus, this focusing ring becomes, if I just point this at my screen, as you move that ring, if you can see, you sh I'll get a little magnified window in the middle. So it goes from there. I move the ring and it magnifies that middle section and the fl screen's flickering a bit. That's just because of the lights I'm using, but it allows you to critically focus. Beautiful. And the thing about that is it's really, really smooth and responsive. It's not at all fiddly like some cameras can be. That's really good. So autofocus, aspect ratio, aperture, shutter speed, exposure comp, zoom. Those are the important things. Now let's get into the menus on the back. It's not the easiest camera to set up. There's a lot of menu options. So I'm just going to go through what I consider the important ones. I also should mention that because I'm shooting RAW almost exclusively, a lot of these settings have no effect on a RAW file. So I'm going to pretty much skip past them. First of all, picture size, large. We want 16 megabytes. So that's the large. This is for JPEGs of course. Um, so we can leave that alone just in case you do shoot JPEGs. What I want is quality. And now we've got the option of choosing JPEGs, which are those dots or little squares, large, small, or medium, I should say, raw plus JPEG or raw only. So I'm going to just choose raw and leave it there. Photo style has nothing to do with raw files at all. Neither does filter settings, neither does color space. Metering mode is set to default by default to this multi-field metering, which is an excellent choice. And I should mention, I reset this camera to its default factory settings before I started this video. So if you bought a camera like this, you should see this camera set up the way I'm showing it you now, so you can follow along. Highlight and shadow doesn't make any difference at all. So let me just step through to the next page. Incidentally, if you look on the right hand side here, you'll see that there's foot pages of menus, two out of four, it says there, and there's a little bar which shows you where you're at in the sequence. And down the left-hand side are, are sections like chapters of the different menu items. So right now we're just in the little camera symbol for camera settings. So the top two have no, no effect on raw files. Red eye remo removal, the same thing. Auto ISO does. So we'll probably set that on to 3200. Any more than that, and the images can get a little bit noisy. So let's leave it there. You can always override it later on. Minimum shutter speed is on auto, and that means that the minimum shutter speed it will use when you're in auto ISO will vary slightly. Oops, I think when, I'll just go back to the menu there. There we go. Um, when you're zooming in and out. So that's useful to leave that one on. Long shutter noise reduction. Uh, if you are using this camera on a tripod and you're doing exposures of one second or longer, the camera will take a second exposure uh, with the shutter closed to remove noise. That can get in the way of you shooting quickly. Like if you're doing 30 seconds, you'd have to wait another 30 seconds. The net result is definitely a better result with lower noise, but sometimes you need to override that because you want to shoot the next picture. So it gives you the option of turning that off. Diffraction compensation, same thing. Uh, it does only affects raw, uh, JPEGs, not RAWs. Stabilizer, I'll leave on. Um, the only time I will turn this off is if I'm on a tripod. It's always a good idea to turn off stabilizers when you're on a tripod, especially when you're using normal lenses like on this one. Not uh, some, some other cameras with really big telephoto lenses can benefit from the stabilizer staying on, but that's a whole different ball game. On this one, on for hand holding, off for, shut, uh, for um, tripod use. Burst rate, I'm not shooting bursts, uh, but I'm leaving it on high in case I do. 4K photo, which is this little button here. I've never used that, so I'll leave that one alone. Self timer can be set to 10 or two seconds. So leave it on. So on a tripod, uh, it's a nice idea to use a self timer so you can actually press the shutter button and then take your hands away so you get a really stable picture rather than trying to hold the camera steady. Or even if you press the shutter carefully, you can flex the camera slightly as you press and make the picture a bit wobbly. Uh, just leave the self timer on for that. Time lapse, again, that's for JPEGs and so on. Same with stop motion. Panorama settings, again, that will produce a JPEG, but it's, it's actually worked pretty well, the panorama. And you can sweep panorama with this. If you tap on that, oops, I've just got to, not very accurate with my finger here, am I? There we go. You've got the direction, which can be left to right or right to left, or it can be up and down as well. So you can have vertical panoramas, which are interesting, but it does create a JPEG and I'm shooting raw. And if I do a panorama, I will do that manually later by taking multiple pictures here. 
Next section, recording quality for video. Um, let's not do video. It's just remember, uh, just before I move on, that when you are shooting video on pretty much any camera up to seriously high-end cameras that are beyond the scope of a video like this, you are shooting effectively uh, JPEGs. So the settings on the camera absolutely matter in a way that shooting stills in RAW doesn't. So you really have to pay attention to these settings and white balance, for instance, is a really important one. But that's video, so let's move on to setting the camera up a bit more. Exposure. Now it says there's seven screens here and there's five chapters, but those seven screens cover all five of those chapters. So I'm just going to keep going down and you should see that increment down as we go. ISO increments, leave that alone. One step between ISO increments, like 100, 200, 400 seems to be reasonable. Extended ISO, we'll leave that off. We don't need to go up to the really, really high ISOs because they will get a bit noisy. So I'll leave that alone. Exposure compensation reset, to leave that off. Leave all the locks off. You do have an AE uh, lock button here in case you want to hold that down when you've taken uh, when you're half when you've taken a reading by half pressing the shutter button. You can lock the exposure and the focus there, but it's actually easier just to do it with the shutter button. So we'll leave that one alone. So these are all on default. Let's leave those alone. Definitely not half press release because that makes this very, very sensitive. Next one, page two, eye sensor AF, uh, leave that one off. Pinpoint AF setting, leave that one off. AF assist light. That one is a little lamp on the front of the camera right there, which projects just a little bit of light onto the subject when you are working in low light and the autofocus needs some light to work with can be really useful in low light. However, it can be also quite obtrusive. So if you're shooting discreetly in low light, you'd want to turn that off. So I've got that turned on at the moment, but it's something you, you can disable later on. Um, let me see what else have we got here. AF area display off, let me move. Oops, I've missed a screen. There we go. Leave these off. Uh, function button set. You can choose to set a whole bunch of function buttons around the camera and on the rear screen to all sorts of different functions. Uh, rather than go through those, I will leave it up to you to decide exactly how you want your camera set up. But this means that you can make the camera more responsive to the way you prefer to work. Quick menu, leave that on preset. I'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, control ring, which is on the front of the camera here, we'll leave that on default. Then we, oops, I didn't mean to go out of there. Whoops, let's come back to the menu and we're in there. Exposure, focus, operation, bum, 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 bum. There we go, page four, video button. Now there's the video button right there. If you um, find that you press it by mistake, which is actually quite hard on this camera, it's quite well recessed. You could disable the function of that button so you can't shoot a video by accident. Touch settings I'll leave alone. It's nice to have the touch screen on the back. Uh, zoom lever will leave on default. Oh, here's one we definitely want to change. Duration of the auto review, which means that when you've taken a picture, it will show you the picture in the viewfinder for two seconds, which means that's two seconds that you're not shooting another picture if something interesting happens. I would recommend either turning it off or putting it on hold. And that means that when you shoot a picture and you don't lift your finger, you will see the picture in the viewfinder. And then when you lift your finger, it will disappear. So it's a nice little check. Personally, I turn it off because I can always look at the picture later anyway, and I don't want that to get in the way of the next picture. Monochrome live view, that's actually pretty cool because if you've ever noticed a professional cinema camera, they, their viewfinders are often in black and white. The color's not a distraction and it can make it easier to focus if you're critically focusing. We'll leave it off for the time being, but it's really quite nice to have that. It just makes the viewfinder into black and white. Doesn't mean that you're not shooting a color picture. Constant preview, leave that one off. Uh, next one, page oops, five, peaking. This is for manual focus. When you actually got the camera set to manual focus here, you can see a focus peaking. And if I just come out of the menu here, and where we have that, can you see that blue? haze that's what's in focus and if i rotate the focusing ring if you can see that you you'll see the focus change from really blurred to there's a little blue it's quite subtle that means that that's the highest contrast part of the picture so that you know it's in focus so that's really neat to have that on if you're manually focusing better display peaking histogram turn that on that gives you the 
the histogram there and then we can slide that around the screen probably the top left hand or top right hand corner is the best place for it leave that where that is guidelines for composition you can leave those have those on if you like uh, highlights zebra pattern zebra pattern is worth turning on if you put it onto zebra 2 what that means is that any pixel in the picture that's over exposed as in 100% white or more will flash in the viewfinder or give you it's, it's kind of not so much flashing as like well they're zebra stripes it's a little bit of a between the two but you'll see it quite clearly in the picture and if I come out of there and if I overexpose the picture a lot look you should be able to see those zebra stripes and my histograms moved again there can you see those zebra stripes as I move that around that's showing me where the the, which parts of the image are beyond white and if I dial my exposure comp back we can set the exposure and that histogram now is perfectly placed take back to the menu exposure meter now I'm going to turn this one off because I don't know if you noticed before but right down here when I change the exposure down the bottom I've got 125th at f2 that's the camera's recommendation and I'll come to parts of that in a sec but I find that really quite intrusive so I'm going to turn that off and then we won't see that again. And then page six of seven, um, we can leave those on default, leave it on default, 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 default. We can leave all those alone. And then the last one is for profile setup. So you can save these settings for your future use if you have like two different ways you want to use the camera, maybe for video and maybe for stills, something like that. Um, tools, there's not a lot in there that we need to discuss in great detail. Um, the most important one I would expect is uh, next one here, which is re not reset. Uh, I've got to find it. Format. So when you put a fresh card in, you might want to format that card. It's often better to do it with the, um, the camera rather than the computer. That top there, uh, that top one there is just so that you can reset the level adjustment so that the camera is level. Uh, it like recalibrates it. That's it for the menus. There's no, um, in that those sets of menus, there's another menu I wanna point out to you, which is the quick menu, which is this button here. And this, if you look carefully, you'll see there's a little red line underneath the relevant um, section, which we can, and we can tap around these symbols. So that's video, aspect ratio, raw, manual focus, etc. Manual focus settings, that's not moving. White balance, oh, that's because I've got it on manual focus. That's why I put it on autofocus. And now this is something I definitely want to show you. AFS, and you see that there? That is the 49 point autofocus, which means that it will see 49 area. That means it picks the focusing point for you. And I would rather you didn't use that. I find it much better to pick center focus and now when I come back out of here, you'll see there's a little box in the middle of the viewfinder. That's what you focus on when you half press the button. It's not, it's a little bit too close to focus, but you'll get the idea. Okay. That means that you are choosing the focus point, not the camera. So you are choosing what the camera is focusing on, what the subject is. That's important that you do that yourself. Uh, so that's focusing, single point, auto white balance. That's okay. Um, it has no effect on a raw file. Uh, by habit, I tend to set it on daylight. Auto ISO, if you want to use it, uh, I find that works pretty well. But if you choose to use a fixed ISO, you can, of course, choose it there. It's not going to do it. Why is it not going to do that? There we go. I've got to slide my finger. My bad. There we go. It's on 200. Come on. My fingers must be a bit dry. There we go. It's on 200. Exposure compensation, shutter speed, aperture and metering. Now, some of these you control with the dials, which is why you can't change them here and here. Let's have a look at the top controls and we'll just show you how the camera uh, should be set up, at least to my way of thinking. So this dial here we mentioned before is the aperture ring. If you take that off the A, you are choosing the aperture. So it is aperture priority. This is the aperture you've chosen and the shutter speed dial is on A for automatic. So what's happening here is the camera is choosing the shutter speed for you. So that's aperture priority automatic. If I reverse that and put this onto a shutter speed, I'm now choosing one thousandth of a second and it's going to choose the aperture for me, which I prefer not to do. My absolute preference is to choose the aperture here and set the shutter speed um, to A so it chooses that for you.
exposure compensation dial here. Now, if you can see on the back of the camera, if I just point that at my keyboard like that, as I dial that, you'll see the picture get brighter and darker and you'll see the histogram go left and right. This is me overriding the camera's best guess. Now I'm pointing it at something white, so it will generally underexpose the picture because white tends to fool the camera into thinking something is uh, not as bright as it should be. So you need to override it a little bit. And you'll also see if uh, those zebra stripes coming into play, like I showed you before. So that's what the exposure compensation dial does. There's also a little button here, which I want you to be careful of, because if you hit that button right there where it says A, you'll see on the back, you get this A here, a little red box. If you see that, then the camera is on fully automatic everything and you can't override things like, or anything basically, it's on fully point and shoot mode. And mm, this camera is better than that. Why have all of these controls if you're not going to use them? I think that it would be a really good idea to not turn that on as much as possible. But the thing is, and the reason why I'm making a bit of a fuss about it, I suppose, is it's really easy to hit that button by mistake when you are turning the camera on with the little lever right there. Okay, so just mind that you don't press that by mistake. And if the camera starts behaving a bit weirdly, like you can't change anything, it's probably because you've got that button checked. If you want to use the camera like a phone and just point and shoot, by all means use that. You, you get a perfectly respectable result, but you don't have any control. And I think you would be better off having control of the camera. And one last thing I just want to leave you with is if you can see on the side of the camera here, just to the right of the viewfinder, if I bring that up, hopefully it'll focus, there's a little dial just there. That adjusts the magnification of this viewfinder. OK, so that you can adjust the diopter of the viewfinder to suit your eye. The idea is that you will dial that dial until with your eyes in a relaxed. Well, yeah, relaxed, not squinting um, with or without glasses up to you. You can do it both ways, but without your glasses, dial that dial until the letters and numbers or the little pixels on the screen look sharp, not the picture itself, because we're actually trying to set the screen magnification here to match your eye so that when you're looking through it your eye is relaxed and the image looks as sharp as possible so you should look at the text and the numbers in the viewfinder and make sure they're as crisp as possible you'll see it when you try it just do all that little dial and then leave it alone and that means that that is now set to your eye again you could use it you can do it with or without your glasses personally i only need reading glasses so i tend to shoot without glasses and that is really really useful for me Okay, so that's the camera. So that's pretty much the way I've got the camera set up. There is a lot more that you can do with this camera. Um, it's taken me a while to go through those menu items. And again, that's just the way I've got the camera set up. But you can make this camera into a fully featured professional grade camera, not in terms of its quality, which of course is you know, not as good as an SL2 or an M10, but in terms of its operability, so that you've got the traditional aperture priority or manual exposure, you've got single point focusing, and it makes the camera more responsive. Um, you may have gathered from my various videos that I'm not a big fan of fully automatic. I would much rather that you take control of the camera yourself, and that makes the photograph your photograph, not the camera's photograph, all right? That's why I talk about aperture priority, choose your aperture, let the camera choose the shutter speed. That's fine because the meter is there to be used, but you're making the creative choice of that aperture and then everything else tends to fall into place after that. Like with so many things in photography, there are many, many ways to do these things. This is just the way I found over my years of experience uh, that works pretty well. So there we have it, the Leica Deluxe 7. If you've enjoyed this video, please feel free to comment below or click the subscribe button. This is, I'm Nick Rains. I'll talk to you again very soon.